1979, police in Wichita, Kansas, make a shocking public announcement. What we said in essence is we have a serial killer here. We don't know who the individual is. We need your help. People were scared, they were terrified, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. On the loose, a man known as BTK, short for Bind, Torture, Kill. Along with his sadistic crimes, he taunts police and the public with a string of cryptic notes. He's using the name BTK, and he's saying he's gonna do this again. On every level, it's fascinating. On every level, it's terrifying. Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their eyes, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. January 1974, Wichita, Kansas. Situated in the heartland of the American Midwest, the community retains what many refer to as a small town feel. Wichita was a wonderful place to live in. It was your typical mid-sized city with clean air, good schools, good jobs, good economy. It was a terrific place to live and raise a family. At the time, the Otero family are newcomers to Wichita. Joseph Otero has found work as a flight instructor and mechanic in the city. He and his wife, Julie, have five children, ranging in age from nine to 15 years old. The Oteros were a nice family. They had just moved in. They didn't have a lot of uh, friends in town yet because they had just got here, but those friends that they had made really liked these people a lot. January 15th. After taking his three older children to school, Joseph Otero is at home with his wife and their two youngest children, nine-year-old Joseph Jr. and 11-year-old Josephine. They're you know, still a little bleary-eyed, uh, eating breakfast, just getting ready for the day. And while they're doing that, this man sneaks up into the backyard, up to the back door. The man cuts the phone line, then enters their home. So they were all at the breakfast table when they were attacked. 3.30 p.m. Two of the Otero children return from school. Strangely, the garage door has been left open and the family car is missing. They see you know, mom's purse on the living room floor. It's been dumped out. All the breakfast food and the dishes are still in the kitchen and nobody's answering them when they're calling out, trying to find somebody home. Then, in the bedroom, a terrible sight. The lifeless bodies of their parents. Charlie Otero returns home to find his younger brother and sister in shock. They rush out of the home for help. Mrs. Otero, she was found fully clothed, laying face down on the bed in, in their bedroom with a rope around her neck, put a plastic bag over her head. Mr. Otero, likewise, was strangled with a bag over his head. Little Otero boy was found in his bedroom in a similar fashion, bags over his head. A few minutes later, uh, an officer goes down the steps into the basement, and it's dark down there, so he's going down the steps. He gets down into the basement. He's feeling around for a, a light switch, brushes against something, something hanging finds a light switch, turns it on, and there's a teenage girl hanging from the ceiling from a noose. The scene shocks even the most seasoned officers. All of the victims were, were tied and bound. It was a very excruciating death. Gruesome. Forensic experts arrive to help shed light on the sadistic crime. They went over the house. You know, 
square inch by square inch, trying to sort out every possible clue they could find. The crime was premeditated, the killer prepared. Everything that this person used at the crime scene, he brought with him. There was more than one kind of knot used to tie the hands, to tie the ankles, to tie the knees together. Whoever did this knew a number of different kinds of knots. The detectives were telling each other, you know, this guy must be some sort of sailor. I mean, who else would possibly know all these varieties of, of how to tie knots? Police find semen near one of the bodies, suggesting a sexual component to the attack. Word of the violent crime soon reaches the local media. I recall getting called to the scene because they had the report of a, a dead body at, at this scene. Then we found it was two people, then three people, then four people, and then two of those people were children. And we found that they had been brutally murdered. I could tell that the detectives were shaken. That, and I don't mean physically shaken, I mean you could see it in their face that this was something different. Wichita had never seen anything like this before. It was inconceivable that someone could come in to a family and kill four people. It absolutely terrified the community. Killings like that happened on the East Coast, on the West Coast, but not in the heartland. The missing Otero car is found in a parking lot several blocks away, presumably driven there and abandoned by the killer. Eyewitnesses claim to have seen a mysterious man in the area. Vague descriptions lead to a composite drawing, but no concrete leads. This was a deliberate torture, uh, death. So the immediate reaction to the investigators was that, that perhaps this was a revenge killing. They were trying to anything they could think of to try to get information about the Oteros, their connections, and who might have done this. The investigation went on and on and on and on. This was going to be one of Wichita's great unsolved murders, that perhaps somebody just blew into the city, kills the people, and heads out. Later that same year, a startling development. Rumors and a premature news report about a possible suspect prompts a mysterious phone call to the Wichita Eagle, the local newspaper. On the other end, an anonymous caller says that police are on the wrong track. He says that if they really want to know who killed the Oteros, they should visit the public library and look inside a specific book. The caller claims he has left a note about the crime. Police visit the library that same day. Inside the book, police find a typewritten letter, a victim-by-victim -victim account of the sadistic Otero murders. It is written in disjointed, broken English. It had all sorts of details that only the killer would know. He described the positions of each body, the rooms that they were found in. But he was telling us that, you know, he did this, I want the recognition for this. They just couldn't believe that the killer would actually invite attention by sending a letter. The letter ended with, the code words for me will be, find them, torture them, kill them. BTK, remember the initials you'll see them on the next body. Although written by the killer, the note proves untraceable and leads to no concrete suspects. Once again, the investigation seems to reach a dead end. March 17, 1977. Close to three years after the Otero murders, Wichita police receive a call on their emergency line. Responding to the scene, police find the body of a young woman, 26-year-old Shirley Vianne, face down on her bed. The scene bears a sick similarity to the Otero murders. Detectives notice the same thing. Knots, tape, tied in some fashion to a bed. In this case, there are survivors. Shirley Vianne's three children, badly shaken but unharmed. Sitting down with police, they paint a horrible picture of what took place. 
A few hours earlier, five-year-old Stephen was sent to the store to pick up groceries. On his way home, a man stopped and showed him a photo, claiming he was looking for someone. Unable to help, Stephen returned home. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. And there's the guy who had been out on the street with the photograph. The guy starts asking questions, you know, is anybody home? Is your mother home? The mother hears this and comes to the door. I think he says he's a private detective or something. I think he might have shown some fake ID. But then he shoulders his way into the home, pulls a gun, and takes control. He begins to tie them up, and he's prepared. He starts pulling out rope. At that point, they just become, you know, horrified, and they're screaming. The man forces the children into the bathroom, tying the door closed with a rope. The oldest child was able to open the door a little bit as his mother was being killed, suffocated. Imagine anything more terrifying for a child than watching your mother be killed. We use child psychologists and others to try to get as much information out of the kids as we possibly could. They were able to tell us that it was a big man. Of course, when you're a little guy, you think everyone's big. It was a big man and uh, that he was white uh, and that he had a bag and that he wore gloves. The children described it as being a, a black bag. Inside of that, there were probably some type of a weapon, tape, plastic bag, bindings, tools that he thought that he needed to uh, finish the job, so to speak. The police really didn't have much to go on other than a, a vague description that this guy might be a, a white male. That's, that's all they knew. That's most of the male population in Wichita, and that's about all they had. Although no hard evidence links the murder to the earlier Otero crime, there is a growing fear behind closed doors that the man known as BTK is behind both attacks. At that point, there was some real strong debate about what they should do. Should we try to communicate with this person, or is that just going to make him kill more people? If we go and warn people in the media, if we call a press conference, is that just going to inspire more, more killings? The killer's next move will force their hand, turning fear in Wichita into widespread panic. 1977, in Wichita, Kansas, 26-year-old Shirley Vianne has been sadistically murdered. In an earlier crime, four members of the Otero family met a similar fate, bound and suffocated in their home. Although police lack evidence connecting the crimes, they fear a serial killer is at large. Another attack removes all doubt. In December, a man enters a downtown phone booth and calls police. He informs them that there has been a murder, giving them the address and name of a victim, Nancy Fox. Without identifying himself, he walks away from the booth. Officers respond to the address in question, forcing the locked door. We found Nancy Jo Fox bound and gagged uh, within her residence on a bed. Her closet door was open, and there was a pile of clothes. It looked like somebody had made a little chair and waited in the uh, closet. The, you know, he'd cut the phone line and had broke in the back window. Although a search for prints leads nowhere, police find semen, just like at the Otero mass murder. Personal effects also seem to be missing, including Nancy's driver's license. Since the scene appeared untouched when they arrived, police realize only one man could have made the phone call earlier that day. Nobody else would have known except the killer that, uh, that Nancy Fox was dead. I mean, they did as thorough an investigation as they could to try to get information about who made that call. We had witnesses that claimed to have seen the person on the phone. He didn't actually hang the phone up. He just walked off from it. One witness describes the man as being six feet tall, possibly with light-colored hair. Most revealing, he wore a uniform, meaning he may be a tradesman. 
Hoping his voice may help identify him, police get a recording of the phone call. Audio experts filter out the background noise so that the killer's words stand alone. We were able to get a little bit of information that it was typical Midwestern voice and, and nothing specific, so it didn't pan out. The killer wastes little time in making contact again. In February of 1978, an envelope arrives at the offices of Wichita's Cake TV. Inside, a detailed typewritten letter claims responsibility for a total of seven murders involving the Oteros, Shirley Vianne, Nancy Fox, and another unnamed victim. The envelope contains a detailed sketch of Nancy Fox face down on her bed, along with a poem titled, Oh, Death to Nancy. I will never forget the communication that was, there was one line in there that said, how many more people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper? How chilling is that? After comparing himself to other famous killers like Jack the Ripper, the son of Sam, and the Boston Strangler, the writer reiterates his own name of choice. Mind, torture, kill. Initials B, T, K. It was easy, it was short, and it said everything you needed to know about the mind of this man. That same day, reporters take the envelope to police chief Richard Lemunyan. The accuracy of the sketch of Nancy Fox assures him it is from the killer. So it was obvious to us that he had taken pictures, Polaroid pictures of, of the crime scene. At the risk of giving BTK the publicity he craves, police feel they have little choice but to sound the public alarm. When it became evident that we had to tell people what was going on. And the police chief actually came on our television station that night on the 10 o'clock news and announced to the public, ladies and gentlemen, we have a serial killer loose and his name is BTK. We don't know who it is. We can't protect people. Everybody needs to be on guard because there's a guy out there and we can't stop him. This was a much more frightened community than either after the Otero murders or after the first BTK letter because this was official by the police. The lock companies were busy. The alarm companies were busy. The gun companies were busy because all of a sudden, nobody felt safe anymore. Each evening, police field calls from terrified residents, too scared to enter their own homes. It might be four or five times a shift. They would have this heart-pounding reaction of going into a dark house with your flashlight and gun out. Check the phone line, check the telephone, see if the phone's dead. And you go through the whole house, eventually they would get, you know, where's your uh, bedroom closet? And They'd go in there last, and there's nobody there. In their search for suspects, police have little more to go on than a vague description of a white male, possibly six feet tall, who may wear a uniform for his work. We got hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of calls as to who this individual might be. They were making lists of uh, the known sexual uh, predators in town. They were uh, cross-checking the lists of predators, violent people, criminals just released. Since BTK references other serial killers in his letters, some feel he may have done research on the subject. We went to the public library, uh, but we were able to, in those days, uh, get a list of who had checked out the serial killer books. And we did the same at the Wichita State University Library. The locations of the crimes are mapped out and scrutinized for possible clues. We thought that there was a comfort zone for BTK, a kill zone. Everything that we know about BTK occurred within that area. Uh, the phone calls, the kill sites, uh, the dumping of the cars, um, the dropping off of the letters. We had all kinds of maps, circles, and a circle of a certain radius would go through all the victims' houses. They all occurred on a north-south street. All the victims were on the west side of the street. 
But there was always an exception, you know, be well through all the house, but one. Well, okay, we couldn't explain the but one. Sometimes you can't see the force for the trees. You're always looking for these patterns, and the harder you look, it's not there. With the public living in fear, a growing number of detectives search for a break in the case. They know it is only a matter of time before BTK strikes a game. 1978, the city of Wichita, Kansas is being held hostage by a serial killer known as the BTK Strangler. Four members of the Otero family, as well as Shirley Vianne and Nancy Fox, have been sadistically murdered. A seventh victim, unnamed by BTK, is now believed to be 21-year-old Catherine Bright, tied up and stabbed to death in her home, not long after the Otero crime. Despite an intensive investigation, police have no concrete leads. We developed a lot of suspects. We uncovered a lot of weird individuals, but we never did identify the uh, strangler. In April of 1979, a 63-year-old woman named Anna Williams returns home after spending an evening with relatives. Inside, she notices drawers in her bedroom have been left open, and items are out of place. A few days later, this woman gets a letter, a little parcel in the mail, and in the parcel was her scarf and a little note that said, you weren't home, but I was BTK. The parcel also includes a poem titled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? in which BTK recalls waiting for her in her home that night. There's a crude drawing, the drawing of what he intended to do to her. He intended to tie her up like, uh, like Stone Age hunters would tie up a kill. You know, bind her up to a pole in some fashion and then uh, kill her. Showing his affinity for the spotlight, BTK sends an almost identical package to Cake TV. New contact by the killer sparks another wave of fear. A lot of people were traumatized. We had no connection to the case other than they, that they lived here. With few leads, many detectives believe the most direct path to the killer lies through the letters themselves. They were the only things that we had that we knew he had created, touched, handled, that we had any hope of trying to trace down any additional information about. The letters that were typewritten on a typewriter that wasn't particularly well-tuned, in other words, the letters all didn't line up with one another exactly right. And none of them were originals. We received photocopies. But we did work with our typewriter examiner on trying to find out in a brand of typewriter, for example. But it was a common typeface that he wasn't able to identify. The typewriter may be a dead end, but police soon learn that copiers can imprint marks on pages they process. Some of these copy machines leave sort of machine fingerprints just like human fingerprints. Industry help and careful lab work leads to a breakthrough. Amazingly, technicians are able to identify a unique combination of machine, paper, and ink. At that point, it was all legwork because my partner and I had to physically go touch every copy machine we could find in the city of Wichita. And they were hoping maybe this was some guy in a business who didn't realize that uh, the photocopy could be tracked. Police find what they are looking for. BTK's original letter was clearly copied on a machine that sits in the basement of the Life Sciences Building on the campus of Wichita State University. When we were able to tag that particular machine in the basement of that building, that's the first time we could scientifically prove that whoever had made that copy that was sent to us had been physically on the university grounds. Well, maybe he's a student at Wichita State. You know, he's using a library, he's using a machine at Wichita State. Maybe he's, you know, around, he's, maybe he's studying, doing this in his spare time. 
Yet another new list is compiled for cross-referencing, this time involving all white male students at WSU. That list, however, is thousands of names long. Several months pass with no new leads. Curiously, at the same time, there are no new BTK messages or attacks. We always kind of had the nagging feeling that the guy was so hard to catch because he was just so erratically random. In 1984, fearing the BTK case will grow cold, Police Chief Richard LeMunion handpicks a special group of detectives to remain on the case. The purpose of the task force was twofold. Number one, to catch him. That was our ultimate goal. But short of that, to make sure that we had done everything that we as a law enforcement agency could possibly do to investigate the case. The team is soon dubbed the Ghostbusters for their closed door meetings and elusive target. Working with the FBI, the secretive Ghostbusters enlist the help of Stephen Brady, a professor of mathematics at Wichita State University. They wanted my expertise to say, where are we with the world of computers now? What does the department have a chance of doing? In time, I became a full member of the task force. With Professor Brady's help, old paper lists involving possible suspects are soon digitized. I developed databases for all of these things. And once we had the data in the system, my programs would go in and uh, look for uh, common something. So we had a list on about every kind of, of aspect of a person that you could think of. The software helps create a list of 200 persons of interest based on the number of times they appear in the database. Although DNA technology is not yet available, police do know the blood type of the killer from the semen he left at two scenes. Visiting each person on their latest list, police secure saliva or blood samples for comparison. Blood typing allows them to eliminate some names, but gives them no concrete suspects. By 1986, almost nine years have passed since BTK's last known murder. After a string of brutal crimes, he seems to have vanished into thin air. At the time, the FBI believes he is dead, in prison, or living somewhere else. They kept telling us that this individual could not stop killing, and that if he wasn't killing in Wichita, then he was killing somewhere else. Did we believe that? No. We knew that he was walking among us. That was the scary part. The Ghostbuster task force soon dwindles as detectives move on to other assignments. Before going their separate ways, they vow that should BTK ever resurface, they will play on his biggest weakness. They knew he was an egomaniac, so they thought, well, okay, what do we do if he ever resurfaces? We will play to his ego, and we'll get him communicating. It, over time, started kind of fading away, both from the uh, public mind and from the police department. January 2004. On the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders, the first known BTK killings, the Wichita Eagle runs a newspaper story recalling the fear that plagued the city at the time. The article points out that while many older residents recall the fear that was rampant those days, many young people in Wichita have no idea who BTK is. He is, to some, a forgotten killer. It was the newspaper article that really uh, started opening the floodgates. And it infuriates BTK, who's never left town. March 19th, 2004. The Eagle receives a letter containing a photocopy of three photos and a driver's license. The license belongs to Vicki Wagerly, a Wichita woman killed in her home around the same time the Ghostbusters disbanded. Some feel they are dealing with a hoax and that the photos are crime scene photos taken by police. One reporter, however, points out a disturbing difference. Look at that, these photographs. Look at her hands. 
And I look, and, and I've, I'm enough of a police reporter, I look, her hands are in different positions. And her top has been moved from photograph to photograph. And there's a slightly different body position. And I just go, oh my goodness. Police never move a body at a crime scene. These are not crime scene photos. Look at this return address. The initials are BTK. The story hits Wichita like a bombshell. It was front page news. It was the lead story in all the TV stations. There was true fear that went through, went through the city during this period of time, and rightfully so. I mean, uh, here this guy is back. Would he kill again? That was the question. And nobody knew the answer to that question. March 2004. In Wichita, Kansas, the serial killer known as BTK has resurfaced after more than two decades of silence. With the public on high alert, hundreds of tips pour into police headquarters. Working with the FBI, Ken Landwehr, one of the last remaining members of the Ghostbusters task force, helps implement the strategy the Ghostbusters devised in the 1980s, playing on BTK's ego and love of publicity. They decided very quickly that they would start calling press conferences, which would look like real press conferences, but they were really ways to sort of very subtly get him to communicate and to communicate a lot, and it worked. May 4th, 2004. Cake TV receives an envelope from BTK with a word puzzle in it. Words like spot, victim, and follow emerge from the page, suggesting the way he prepares for a kill. Others like realtor, insurance, and serviceman indicate the way he gains entry to homes. The envelope even contains chapter headings meant to outline his life of crime. The killer was writing his own book, The BTK Story. One month later, a Wichita resident finds another BTK package. It contains typewritten pages under the title, Death on a Cold Winter Morning. It's a grisly account of BTK's first known murders, the four members of the Otero family, in 1974. In the next 11 months, there were close to a dozen messages. So he was very busy. Another package found in a park contains a doll bound and gagged, along with a driver's license taken from Nancy Fox, murdered in 1977. Typewritten pages titled Chapter 9 paint a horrifying picture of how he stalked and killed the young woman. He was seeking this publicity. He loved the publicity. And you know that he was reading the newspaper and turning on the TV every night because he wanted to see himself as BTK on television. They were calling these sort of semi-news conferences to get him communicating but so that he would communicate to the point where he made a mistake. On January 25th, 2005, police get their first big lead. Cake TV receives a postcard from BTK. It leads police to another package and letter. This one left in the back of a truck sitting in a hardware store parking lot. Detectives visit the hardware store and speak with staff members. One recalls finding a cereal box with markings on it in the back of his pickup truck two weeks earlier. At his home, he retrieves it from the garbage for police. Inside, Police find a note from BTK, in which he asks whether or not it would be safe for him to send his next writings to police on a computer floppy disk. He tells police to respond in the newspaper classifieds, using another nickname, Rex, Latin for King. Knowing that a computer disk may contain hidden data about its user, police respond with an ad. It reads simply, Rex, it will be okay. While police await BTK's next move, the hardware store employee who found the last package shows them where he was parked the day it turned up. The spot is within sight of one of the store's many security cameras. One of the FBI um, analysts went through that video and was able to 
find the date and time of the, where the drop was occurring. Where a vehicle pulled in uh, next to the employee's truck, and you could see somebody get out and approach the employee's truck and hang around the bed of the pickup truck for a while and get back in his vehicle and leave. From looking at the, the video from that, um, it, it appeared that the vehicle that the, the BTK was driving was a dark colored, fairly new Jeep Cherokee. Contacting the DMV, police learned that there are only 2,500 matching SUVs registered in the area. So we started down that list, you know, looking at people who had Jeep Cherokees. As they hone in on a possible suspect, another BTK package arrives at a local TV station. Police respond and open it. Inside, a possible breakthrough. Oh, could it be? Could, oh boy, it, it was too much to hope for. And they get on the cell phones and they call in and they say, oh, we got the package and it's a BTK package and there is a computer desk. Moments later, a copy of the disk is placed in a computer loaded with special forensic software. In this case, uh, it was evident that there was one uh, valid file on the disk. We're able to see that uh, it appeared that the, at some point in time, the original title of that document had been Christ Lutheran Church. Whoever had been last using it was logged in to a computer using the username or account name of Dennis. So I uh, ran a Google search for the, looking for the church website. <laughs> and right at the very top of the page was the uh, congregational president, Dennis Rader. Okay, what's Dennis Rader's address? Click, click, click. There it is. Whew. Four detectives are out the door. Minutes later, in the Wichita suburb of Park City, they slowly cruise past the house in question. And they see black Jeep Cherokee. Well, that was kind of an independent corroboration that, uh, that we were on the right person. If their suspicions are correct, this church-going family man may also be one of America's worst serial killers. February 20th, 2005. In Wichita, Kansas, police are keeping a close watch on 59-year-old Dennis Rader. Although they still lack hard evidence tying him to the original crimes, police believe he is the BTK Strangler, a serial killer who stalked and sadistically tortured at least eight Wichita residents in the 1970s. Needing a DNA profile to be sure and not wanting to tip off their suspect, police managed to subpoena a tissue sample belonging to Dennis Rader's daughter. Since family members have extremely similar DNA, a simple lab test should tell them everything they need to know. We were all sitting around, you know, they had told us that we'll have the results back within this many hours, and then they got extended and extended a couple times because of some difficulties they were having with testing. And then finally they called and said, it's a match. Dennis Rader was uh, ETK. Everybody, I think everybody was relieved. Um, everybody was excited. February 25th, 2005. Police in unmarked cars take up positions in the suburb where Dennis Rader lives. What they wanted to do is get him away from his business, away from his home. Oh, we had several cars there in order to do at the car stop. At 12.15, Rader appears, driving his truck home for lunch. As he passes, police make their move. Um, they went up to him, he got, got out, went down on the ground, got handcuffed. The best suspect in a case three decades old is soon at the FBI's offices in downtown Wichita. After he protests his innocence for a few hours, police finally confront him with the fact that they have DNA evidence to prove their case. They also show him a copy of the computer disk he mailed to them only days earlier. The FBI agent just leaned, kind of leaned forward a little bit and said, just say it, say who you are. Dennis Rader looked at us and said, I'm BTK. I guess you guys got me, I'm BTK. What follows is one of the most shocking confessions ever heard by police. 
Showing little emotion, Dennis Rader leads them through his crimes, victim by victim. Along with what are now eight known murders, Dennis Rader confesses to two others, those of Maureen Hedge and Dolores Davis, both killed in his own Wichita suburb. In each case, he explains how he picked his victims at random and stalked them. Once inside their homes, he bound and tortured them before finally killing them. He was a ritualistic killer. He would bind the person, suffocate the person, but he would take and he would put the garret around the neck and he would pull it tight. And then the person would almost pass out and then he would let it loose again and he would whisper in her ear, I B T K, and then he would pull it tight again. That's what we were told. I mean, this guy is, if you really have to describe evil, this is an evil person. He just reeks of it as, as you look at him. As he's going through this callous dissertation of how he murdered these innocent people. Every word of Raider's confession is backed up by material found at his office and at his parents' home. He stalked hundreds and hundreds of women over the course of time, took notes, figured out escape routes, figured out who they were, wrote down their addresses. As far as the motive behind his crimes, Raider could only explain it as fantasy and sexual compulsion. In some of his writings, he called it the monster, or Factor X, an urge that drove him to torture and kill. He had a family. He had jobs. Most of the time, he was doing all of this. Dennis Rader's life was a complete lie. Police noticed that Dennis Rader did appear once in their many lists over the years as one of the thousands of students at WSU, where his student identification gave him access to a photocopier. Although he managed to elude police for over 30 years, his love of the public spotlight was his undoing. Attention. That's what it was always about, attention. Him getting attention. His ego. His ego is what got him caught. For the first time ever, headlines about BTK spread relief. People were about as happy as I've ever seen. It was very hard for people to come to grips that this was over because people had spent three decades thinking after a while that we will never get to the bottom of this. But there was also a sense of disbelief. Nobody could believe that this guy was in. He was the guy next door, and that was the most terrifying thing about him. On June 27th, 2005, Dennis Rader pleads guilty to 10 counts of murder in a Wichita courtroom. The judge has Rader describe in his own words each of his brutal crimes. The mood in the courtroom was absolutely dead silence. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Here was a man talking about killing people like it's no big deal. There's no emotion in his voice. He doesn't sound sorry. He's not asking for forgiveness. Uh, he's just detailing this like he's talking about building a house. Detail by grisly detail. In a separate sentencing hearing, Family members unleash years of anger and grief. They'll never ever get to meet her. She's never had a life. You have now lost everything, and you will forever remain nothing. Despite Dennis Rader's efforts to destroy my family, we survive, stronger and closer now more than ever. As far as I'm concerned, when it is all done, Dennis Rader has failed in his effort to kill the Oteros. Thank you. The image that stands out to me is Josie Otero, the few pictures that we've seen where she's alive and just a little kid growing up. This is what this is really about. This is what this guy did. He ended this little, little girl's life. He did it horribly and he did it to her parents and her brother and, and um, six other people. Dennis Rader's crimes were committed at a time when Kansas's death penalty law was not in effect. 
Instead, he receives 10 consecutive life sentences, the harshest penalty the standing law allows. I don't think you could ever, uh, if you murder someone the way that he murdered these individuals, you can ever have, quote, justice, so to speak. But I think you can take, uh, you know, you can find peace in the fact that he's been identified and that he's in prison and that he's not going anywhere. He's in a box and he's going to stay there for the rest of his life. And that is justice. <laughs>